Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, always on those four and BX57, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And for the last week of my second Dreadnought theme month, I'll be taking a look at the 1986 Dreadnought Thunder Machine and its driver, Thrasher. Both Thrasher and the Thunder Machine make their first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe in issue 51 and make their first cartoon appearance in the 1986 season opener five-part mini-series Arise Serpentor Arise in part one. Just removing the driver thrasher for a minute so we can take a look at the Thunder Machine just by itself. The Thunder Machine only has one armament and that is its forward machine guns or gatling guns. One thing I found kind of odd was according to the instructions you're supposed to pull the ammo belt to rotate them. Which I found kind of odd because because the top portions are kind of exposed. It looks like it's a thumb wheel. So you could rotate those. But in fact, there are just a little bit... Um, they're, they're not quite meshed quite right. So I can understand them pulling the ammo belt and rotating the guns that way. One feature that I really like, especially on vehicles, with wheels is of course rubber wheels. These are rubber wheels over a plastic hub. And the rear wheels, which are hidden behind a shield here. So let's just take this off a bit. These ones have the same, but they're not the same wheel. So these ones are quite a bit bigger. And because these rear wheels are bigger, it actually gives it a bit of a slanted racing car style. One nice thing about the front wheels, however, is they rotate. Just like the Awe Striker, for instance. However, the Thunder Machine's wheels actually do something a little bit different in that if you push them enough, they actually lock into the place that they're supposed to be steering into in both directions. The Thunder Machine also has a rear tow hook right above its jet thruster. Uh, I'm not too sure that's a good idea for whatever it's towing. And its last feature is the amount of space it has for dreadnoughts. Of course, there's two seats on the insides, as well as four foot pegs on each of the running boards. So you could potentially have ten figures sitting on here. This top bar part actually goes underneath this ball part, actually goes underneath the roll bar, like so. And you can see the detail on the inside of the uh, cabin a little more. It even has a little steering wheel, which uh, doesn't actually steer the wheels, of course. You can also see the front end of the um, jet intake here as well. Uh, the side mirror is one of the uh, three things which is often missing on the Thunder Machine. So you will have to uh, make sure that that's still on there. It just sort of plugs in there. The other item is of course the steering wheel. Like a lot of uh, G.I. Joe steering wheels, they tend to go missing for some strange reason. Just make sure that that's still in there. And last but not least, is the antenna, which as I've discovered doesn't really plug in there very securely. It is of course supposed to be straight, but mine's a little curved due to uh, bad storage over some time. The Thunder Machine is one of those toys that actually impresses me on a couple of different levels. As a kid, I probably would have really loved this thing. Not Maybe not as a dreadnought vehicle, but just as a post-apocalyptic vehicle. I mean, just look at this thing. 
with the um, jet thruster on the back. Of course, it's the details as an adult that I pick up on that uh, really make me smile. Especially the uh, 1979 model year Trans Ham front end. I'm not quite sure how Ron Rudat, designer of the Thunder Machine, got away with this because I'm sure the front end of a Trans Am would have been just as copyrighted as the name. But there it is nonetheless. But it has little details like there's a little dent in the bumper. There's all sorts of distressed marks on certain parts. I mean this is really what a sort of bashed together junkyard build would be for a Dreadnought. And I find that the other vehicles like the uh, Swamp Fire and even the, the Cycle, the Dreadnought Cycle, they don't really have that completely beat up and worn look that the Dreadnought Thunder Machine has. And yet, it's still quite, I would actually say it's still quite um, symmetrical and quite, well, it has a good style to it, despite the sort of uh, patchwork armor. One thing I do wonder, however, is does this thing have a conventional engine in here somewhere or does it completely rely on the uh, the jet engine i would think that that would get a bit noisy after a while but who knows maybe the dreadnoughts just don't care and now it's time for does a modern figure fit it in as usual i'll be using my 2009 rise of cobra footloose figure i'll just bend his legs a little bit and see if I can't just squeeze him in the conventional way. Eh, he's resisting a little bit. So, let me check the uh, instructions. Put him in this way. Eh, sure, yeah, he fits I think. He's a little bit tall, but certainly he does fit in there. And you can't have a post-apocalyptic inspired vehicle without a post-apocalyptic inspired driver. So this Thrasher comes with only one weapon, and that is a modified lacrosse stick. Now, uh, like a lot of Dreadnoughts, it is of course an improvised weapon, so it has this sort of um, spiked ball in the middle, making this into a mace. I believe these things would have originally had a net um, on one end instead of just the ball. One thing um, to note is <laughs> uh, these little, little chips and scratches all over the uh, uh, shaft. Uh, those aren't sculpted in. Those are because the, the stick actually is way too thick for the um, the hands. So most kids, and in fact most uh, adult collectors, will probably try to jam this thing into his hands, uh, creating all those little nicks. Which, quite frankly, I don't mind because, well, you know, it's a dreadnought. He's supposed to have a little bit of uh, nicks and scratches and paint loss. They don't look all that bad on a dreadnought. Just taking a look at him, he has a lot of padding and spikes and a really good paint job I have to say that um, they uh, they didn't have to do paint jobs like this where the inside of his glove is gray because he would have had this glove on this side but the black portion is a separate sort of armored piece over the glove so they didn't need to show that the uh, the original glove was peeking through but they did so that's a uh, that's a rather nice um, paint application there. Of course all his padding sort of reminds me of the later uh, Road Pig. Of course, uh, well, let's not beat around the bush. These uh, crazy stripes, while those might uh, be, be you know, influenced by this sort of uh, punk rocker of the 80s kind of look, they're mostly inspired by how Mel Gibson looked in uh, 
Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, I believe. So this was clearly influenced by the Mad Max movies. It's actually rather strange that Dasher has all that armor because when you think about it, he's a driver. He doesn't really need all this personal protection on him. But just the way he looks, it looks more like he was just this type of a person who ran around just like this, bonking people on the heads with his lacrosse stick. And in fact, if you read his file card, there's actually no mention of um, him either building the Thunder Machine or his driving skills or anything of a, of a mechanical or automotive nature. It really just seems like he was designed to look like this and just be himself like this. Which I don't mind at all. It certainly gives him a lot more personality than, quite frankly, a lot of uh, drivers sometimes get. Thrasher was the first Dreadnought not to have a real name or place of birth on his file card. Perhaps there wasn't enough space? The modern version of the figure finally gave him both. His real name is Bruno Lacrosse of Brussels, Belgium. But Hasbro lost a copyright on his code name to the famous skateboarding magazine. He's now known as Dreadnought Thunder. While I said his official file card had nothing mechanical or automotive in it to tie him to the Dreadnought Thunder machine, removed from his prototype file card, the significant part is still shown in the comic G.I. Joe Order of Battle number 3, mentions him working on his parents' car's brakes with tragic results. Despite its popularity, the Thunder Machine and Thrasher are pretty easy to find, complete, on the aftermarket and at a reasonable price. There really isn't anything easily breakable on this toy. Just look out for the often missing side mirror, antenna and steering wheel, all of which just peg in. I've never seen a Thrasher with thumbs cracked off either, which you would think would happen when jamming that lacrosse stick into his hands over time. While Thrasher's Thunder Machine was a unique, singular vehicle in the Dreadnought Sum Team, you could add the 1993 Street Fighter II Beast Blaster to the ranks as an extra vehicle. It uses the Thunder Machine mold, is in an even more patchwork colored scheme than the original, but replaces the forward Gatling guns with dual spring missile launchers. As my last Dreadnought item to be reviewed, I'm not buying Zanzibar the Dreadnought Pirate, I have to say that both having the larger amount of Dreadnoughts and this impressive toy have really changed my mind about the Dreadnoughts as a sub-team. When it was just the three originals with no vehicles, I couldn't take them seriously as a threat to an elite military force. And while they still seem like they ought to be battling Slaughter's Renegades or an equally small sub-team, the Dreadnoughts certainly look intimidating now, and while they'll never be my favorite bad guys, I can at least respect them now. And that counts for a lot when playing or displaying them. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.